As we wrap up our discussion on lipids, I just want to recap what we talked about in our previous video very quickly. We mentioned how lipids are hydrophobic and we proved that by looking at fats. Fats are a great way to store energy. Specifically, fats have a structure that promotes this hydrophobicity, we could say. That structure involves a glycerol molecule and a fatty acid, and that fatty acid is usually a long tail of hydrocarbons. And hydrocarbons, as we know, are nonpolar. And because they're nonpolar, they're going to be hydrophobic, and that is why we've confirmed, or how we confirmed, our hydrophobic nature of lipids. We also talked about the idea of saturated versus unsaturated fats. Saturated fats think butter. Butter is usually solid at room temperature because it's fully filled in terms of the carbon skeleton with hydrogens all over are going to be, this hydrogen carbon tail is saturated with fats. That's where the name comes from. Whereas unsaturated fats, we always consider these fats the healthy fats, are the ones that have double bonds. And double bonds, another way to sort of think about this uh, is that these double bonds, they actually have uh, kinks, we could say. And these kinks, oh, let me just get this out of the way. These kinks are what's going to give the double bond nature of the unsaturated fats this liquid ability. They don't stack as well as saturated fats. Unsaturated fats have a liquid um, sort of form in room temperature, like oils. Think oils because they have many double bonds. These double bonds cause kinks, and these kinks create a structure in which liquid is actually preferred over the solid. So now that we understand what fats are in terms of lipids, we can look at the two other types of lipids that are important. One of them is known as a phospholipid. You might have heard of this before. So phospholipids are very interesting. Phospholipids are incredibly cool because they are what are known as amphipathic. Amphipathic. This means that they are both, think of ambidextrous, these are both hydrophobic and what's the opposite? Hydrophilic. Phospholipids have this ability to both love and hate water. That is built in their nature and we'll talk about that when we look at cell membranes later on. Speaking of cell membranes, phospholipids are of course found in cell membranes. You might have heard of the term phospholipid bilayer. Phospholipid bilayer is what is built, uh, what builds our cell membrane. And our cell membrane has both hydrophobic and hydrophilic regions, which helps it function the way that it does. Overall, in terms of structure, a phospholipid contains a glycerol molecule, just like a fat, but it also contains only two fatty acids, not like the triacylglycerol, which actually contains three fatty acids, right? This contains two fatty acids, um, it usually contains a phosphate. That's where that name comes from, phospholipid, phosphate. And in addition, um, usually there's some other group that we don't need to talk about right now that's also there. So that's the phospholipids. And the last thing we want to talk about are steroids. Steroids are also a type of lipid. Um, they have a very unique carbon skeleton. We talked about a carbon skeleton before, but this time the steroid carbon skeleton is actually known as four fused rings. What does that mean? These four fused rings are composed of three diff uh, two different types of rings. Three of the rings will have, uh, three are with six carbons, and one ring is with only five carbons. This is going to promote a specific structure that sort of looks like this. So I'm going to draw a six-membered ring. I'm going to draw another six-membered ring right next to it. And then right next to this one, I'm going to draw another six-membered ring, if I can fit it right here. This is one, two, three, four, five, six. And then right next to this one, I'm going to draw a five-membered ring, if I can fit it right there. So what I want you to notice is that we have six carbons here. What do I mean by that? One, two, three, four, five, six. Same thing for this one. Same thing for this one. And then over here we have five. This is four fused rings. One, two, three, four. Don't worry too much about this structure. What you really want to focus on is this idea that there are four fused rings to create a steroid structure. What separates different steroids from each other, much like what we saw in amino acids, are those R groups. But they're not called R groups in this situation. In this situation, different steroids have different side chains, we can say. 
these side chains differ, causing different functions. They have different. Uh, there's also different functional groups possible. All these things promote uh, the differences between the steroids. Examples of steroids include something like a cholesterol. Cholesterol molecule is a mo one of the most famous steroids. Um, they're actually not found in plants, interestingly enough. Plants do not have cholesterol. If they're not found in plants, they're of course found in animals. Animals rely heavily on cholesterol. Cholesterol gets a bad rap because you always hear of the bad cholesterol, but cholesterol is very important in the human body and animal body. It's actually made um, and synthesized in the liver. So it's not just about eating cholesterol, but it's actually synthesized within our own bodies. It is hugely important in the cell membrane, and it promotes a liquid cell membrane. We'll talk about that a little bit more when we get into that lecture. And it is sort of the basis for all other steroids. Um, we can say that it's the basis for other, that's right, for other steroids. Things like testosterone and estrogen, those are sex hormones, let's say. These things, these hormones, need to have a basic cholesterol structure that is then further modified into testosterone, into estrogen, by putting on different side chains or different functional groups. And this gives us our cholesterol that turns into our, so let's say, estrogen or testosterone, two different steroids that we have commonly heard of. So, last, absolute last thing we want to talk about is this. I've mentioned a lot about lipids, but why are they not polymers? Simply put, lipids are not polymers because if you notice, I never mentioned a true monomer. We can say that they're not polymers because that there are never a situation in which a lipid has, um, there are never, let's say, not many, because there are not many identical units combined together. That's a good way of saying it. Not many identical units. What do I mean by that? Usually there's only about just one to three units that make up a lipid. Remember, we said that a triacylglycerol was what? One, two, maybe three fatty acids. A glycerol, look over here. We have only glycerol plus two fatty acids. There are not many, many hundreds or maybe thousands of units like we saw in our other polymers. Remember, polymers are many subunits combined together. Lipids aren't like that. And most importantly, uh, in addition to that, lipids that are there, the units that are there aren't usually identical. They're usually, let's say, a glycerol. Glycerol is completely different than a fatty acid. The fatty acids can be different from each other based on whatever is there. Um, think of a steroid. A steroid has all these different side chains and functional groups. Those are never ever polymers. They're just one molecule that looks like this, sort of. So overall, we now understand the idea behind lipids. Lipids are hydrophobic. They involve both fats or, or fats, phospholipids, and steroids, and now we understand why they are not polymers because they do not have identical subunits. They do not have many identical subunits combined together. They only have about one to three units, really. So that ends our discussion on biological molecules.